All right, well, greetings everyone. It's good to see everyone. Okay. All right, well, greetings everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Eric D. Olson, and I'm in the department chair in uh, School of Hospitality at Metropolitan State University of Denver. I'd like to welcome you to our first uh, webinar series uh, titled New Frontiers in Hospitality, Tourism and Event Education, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. We created the seminar as a chance for academics, researchers, educators, and other stakeholders to kind of come together um, to, ha to have some thought and conversation regarding new ideas and new topics um, in the field of higher education. Our presentation today is titled Game-Based Learning in Why Education, and our speakers today are Dr. Thomas Meyer and Barry Wiss. So we're very excited to have our fantastic speakers and we look forward to having a, a great conversation. So um, Barry, I believe the floor is yours. Oh, I think uh, Tom, well, you're gonna, uh, I'm more than happy to take the floor, but I think Tom, you're gonna say a few words, uh, Tom, or you want to just jump in? Yeah, next slide, James. Thanks, Eric. Uh, it's a pleasure for uh, giving us a chance to, uh, for Barry and I to share our, our collaboration with you and and uh, other faculty uh, around, the, around the country. So what uh, Barry and I have put together today regarding our game-based learning um, project is uh, a profile of Trincaro family estates that Barry's gonna talk about the winery itself and the family. Then, uh, you know, Barry's a prominent, uh, I'll let him speak to that, but Barry's a prominent wine educator uh, across the globe, actually. Uh, he was the former president of the Wine Education Society and uh, Certified Specialist of Wine. So I think he'll talk to you a little bit about that. You'll find that very interesting. And then what brought us together in our collaboration was uh, the Wine Roma Wheel, which is a wonderful game-based learning activity, a burial profile, what that's all about. And then he'll pass it off to me and I'll talk about experiential learning and then game-based learning in our research. So go ahead, uh, next slide please, and turn it over to you, Barry. All right. OK, and um, I'm, I'm assuming everybody can hear me OK. If you can't, just uh, put something in the chat box. Um, my, and thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. And always great uh, working with you and the students, seeing them every year. And um, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning from Napa Valley. This is a virtual background in the background, but uh, uh, this is actually one of our vineyards. And I'm, I'm speaking to you from the beautiful Napa Valley. And uh, hopefully you can come out and see us at some point. My name is Barry Wiss. I'm Vice President of Trade Relations at Trincaro Family Estates Winery. Uh, located in the heart of Napa Valley. Um, I'm originally from New Orleans, born and raised. I was in the hotel restaurant business. I met my wife of 36 years, holy smoke, um, at the hotel restaurant school at the University of New Orleans. Um, I was transferred with Sheraton Hotels back in the late 1980s to Southern California, quite a culture shock from New Orleans, but uh, it, it was good and it was just very different from New Orleans. I made my way up to Napa Valley for a visit. Uh, my wife and I um, we literally drive down Highway 29 in the heart of Napa Valley, of course, and I looked at her, she looked at me, and you think of what I'm thinking, we quit our jobs, moved up here, been up here ever since. And we have a, a credible relationship with hotel restaurant schools and hospitality schools all over, the, all over the country. And one of the first thing, actually the first thing I tell the students is, so be so proud and be so happy that you selected the world of hospitality for your career, because there's so many different avenues to go down. Um, so we're very fortunate um, to welcome students and inspire them to learn more about the world of food and wine um, and hospitality, of course. Now, I'm very fortunate. I work for an incredible company, an incredible family, one of the largest family owned wine companies in the world and uh, the Trincaro family and originally from Italy. And uh, they came, made their way out to Napa Valley in the late 1940s, 1948 to be exact. Uh, with their life savings, they bought one of the oldest wineries in Napa Valley, and that winery still to this day is called Sutter Home. Uh, they struggled, from, this family was dirt poor up until the mid-1970s. Now, I want to repeat that, mid-1970s. Uh, they were so poor, they were taking bottles out of trash cans from the other wineries because they couldn't afford to buy bottles to bottle their own wine. They were making their really red Zinfandel uh, one year, actually 1975, mid-1970s, and they used a process called Saunier. They were too pure. They were too poor to throw away the free run juice from the red from making the red wine to concentrate their red wine. They pull a little bit of free run juice. They were too poor to throw that throw that little bit of pink Zinfandel juice away. So they had to make a wine out of it. Now there's a lot more to that story. That amazing, incredible story. But that's what we now know as Sutter Home White Zinfandel. And this family, uh, because they were too poor to throw anything away, made a wine out of that pale pink Zinfandel juice. 
and that turned out to be one of the most incredible wines that introduced more people to the to the world of wine um, in our country more than any other wine. And um, still to this day, we're still family owned and operated and very, very proud uh, to say that. And the name Sutter Home is actually still here today because when they bought the, bought the winery, which is one of the oldest wineries in Napa Valley, when they bought it, they had a large sign out front. They were too poor to buy enough paint to paint over the sign. And uh, that's why the name Sutter Home is actually still here today because they were too poor to buy enough paint. Uh, so it's an amazing story and I, we invite you to the winery so we can tell you the story and show you the property that we're so proud of. Now the winery that bears the family name, it, 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 it took them until 2007 for them to actually build an, a winery that bears the family name. And you're looking at it right here, the Trinquero Winery located in the heart of Napa Valley in St. Helena. And this is home and Tom knows this very well. This is also home to our hospitality education center because we're such a large wine company. We welcome wine professionals from all over the world, literally all over the world. Um, and they come here. This is our picture of our winery, but we have another area that's our hospitality culinary center. And you'll see a picture of it coming up in a little bit. And um, this is solely for our partners in business and our specially invited guests like Tom and the students that come every year. And um, so this is where we have our education programs, our certification programs, our culinary programs, and of course our hospitality uh, program that we have there as well. Um, so now a little bit about um, our education program. And when I joined the winery, I've been there close to 27 years now. And my, my, all of my background was in restaurant, hotel, hospitality, on premise, of course, in restaurants and fine dining, for the most part in fine dining. And when I joined the winery almost 27 years ago, we were really just Sutter Home. And nothing wrong with that, but Sutter Home, of course, is a grocery store brand for the most part. 90% of it plus is sold in, in retail, what we call retail, of course, off premise. And so when we decided to get into the restaurant world in ultra premium, now we own over 70 different brands, 70 different brands. And we have a, a, a segment of our company, a large segment of our company just concentrates in hotels and restaurants and more of the high end, uh, what we call ultra premium styles of wine. I said, okay, that's my world. And if you want to relate to anyone in that world, you have to relate to their passion. And, you know, I, I, I say things, you know, all the time that I very, very feel very strongly about. But if you can if you can uh, relate to someone's passion, that's a good thing. It's really a good thing. If, if we have something in common, and I can relate to you, something you're passionate about. We can have a relationship and talk about that thing that, that we have a common passion for. But in business, if you can feed someone's passion, give them something that will actually build that passion even bigger, bigger and better. In business, they will never forget you for it. And I always remember that when I was in the on-premise in the restaurant hospitality world, and I said, you know what, we need an education program. So we developed many, many years ago, 25 years ago or more, our Vine to Dine education programs. And the hallmark of our education programs, and, and I always said, if, if you develop an education program, it can't be a sales pitch. It has to be a true, sincere, and genuine education program. We lead the sales pitch to the salespeople. We're true at sincere education. So the programs that we develop can be applied to any wine in the world. That's number one. Number two, and just important as number one, is it has to be interactive and fun. Because still to this day, wine is a very intimidating thing. It can be very intimidating to, to just about anyone, especially even professionals in the wine business. I still get intimidated by the world of wine. It's so massive. So it has to be fun and engaging and approachable. So we really thought about this. So we pioneered some presentations. And we're going to talk about one in particular that I know Tom is a big fan of, is uh, our Mastering Wine Aromas and the Aroma Wheel of Fortune. So we we introduce a seminar for about, it all depends, and you're seeing a picture of it right now. And actually, this picture, these are, these are sommeliers from Southeast Asia. And we see people from all over the world come here. And they, they, they come to our, our winery in Napa Valley every year and we totally immerse them in wine education and also we have a napa valley certification program that they study everything about napa valley so when it comes to the aroma wheel we do a seminar for about maybe 15 20 minutes in, in understanding wine aromas because you can't enjoy a wine be impossible to enjoy a wine or describe a wine or even think about a wine think about wine critics when they write a review it's all about the aromas so 90 plus percent of what you enjoy in wine or experience in wine are aromas in wine. So we go through a seminar and then we divide the group up into two teams 
and they challenge each other on the aroma wheel of fortune. Now, I, I designed this wheel. I had a local cabinet maker here in Napa um, make the wheel, so it's custom handmade for what we need. We have the aroma vials all the way around the circumference of the wheel. It spins like a big roulette wheel. It lands on a category. It could be tree fruit. Tree fruit, big category. But within tree fruit, you have apple, you have pear, you have peach. So they have to identify the aroma. And then after they identify the aroma and can relate to that aroma in wine, then we ask them, what kind of wine is characteristic of that aroma? So we're not only building their um, recognition of the aroma, but also their vocabulary in describing a wine to a customer. So and it's very fun, very interactive. We have <laughs> we've actually had people start gambling on the wheel. <laughs> we, don't, we don't promote that at the winery, but if people actually start gambling on the wheel. We don't, uh, but that's how much fun they have. And, uh, and Tom, you know I can talk people's heads off, so please use the virtual hook um, <laughs> if you need me to stop. But um, yeah. anything else I'm leaving out, Tom? Anything else you want to touch on well, at this point? Great. That's great. Maybe talk to them about the uh, Certified Specialist of Wine program, possibly. Yes, yes. As our education programs evolved, you have to understand, when I started in the world of wine, certification, whether it be with the Court of Master Sommeliers, Society of Wine Educators, WSCT, and those are the three big organizations in the world as far as professional wine certification. And when I started, it, it, you know, 27, 30 years ago, um, people would say, oh, you have some kind of certification. Well, I don't know what that means. It means something, but I don't know what it means. But now, and over the past maybe 15 years, if you don't have some kind of professional certification and you call yourself a professional in the world of wine, and it goes true for just a lot of industries. It's expected now. It really is. So about 15 or more years ago, uh, we formed a, a very strong alliance with the Society of Wine Educators. Um, and it's the largest, one of the largest wine education certification organizations in the world. We're based in Washington, D.C., um, I've been on the board of examiners, board of directors, and I was actually the president of the organization a period of time. But the CSW program, we sponsor many thousands of people over the years, industry professionals and also students in hotel restaurant school. Um, so it's professional certification. We help students especially to build their resumes before they get into the professional industry. Um, so we're very proud that we'll be able to uh, offer that. And Trinqueros are very generous, very, very generous. And uh, so we're very proud to be to have the opportunity to do that, especially for students who are starting their careers out and have that fire in their eyes to learn more, especially about the world of wine. Thanks, Barry. Uh, appreciate that. And yeah. we'll, give, uh, we'll give everyone time to ask Barry questions as soon as I get finished with my section. So we'll come back to you, Barry. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks, James. We're on the right slide. Uh, so I just wanted to share with uh, with our fellow faculty members, I'm sure you're familiar with the experiential learning. You've heard that term quite a bit. Um, and as I become a, a professor, I, I too have an industry background, much like Barry. I spent my uh, time with Starwood Hotels in the Hawaiian Islands and became a food and beverage director and then an operations vice president. So I've always stayed close to the industry uh, as I worked my way into a professorship. Uh, I began my career at uh, DePaul University in Chicago, and it's a great restaurant dining town and good hotel town as well. But when there was an opportunity to join the faculty at the University of San Francisco, I, I took took the chance of um, moving over there and have now been there uh, seven years and I'm enjoying my first sabbatical as a professor, so I uh, really enjoy that as well. But um, having said that, a lot of my research has been in an applied industry-based research. So this project with Barry was a natural for us both, coming from that uh, industry background and trying to uh, contribute to both the classroom setting, but also to the industry setting and, and developing our students with uh, better wine knowledge and learning how game-based learning can play a role in that. So the roots of this uh, project and this collaboration were grounded in Kolb's experiential learning model. So you can see here the four components concrete experience reflective observation abstract conceptualization and, and then some level of experimentation and then that virtual cycle i found does not have to flow in the exact order that you're seeing here uh, for it to uh, to work well uh, next slide james so here's an example what barry was referring to um and let me first say uh what was important about experiential learning and, and the relationship with Trincaro family estates was really the comprehensive nature of the relationship. So 
what happened was is we ended up, I would call, um, scaffolding the relationship, and it began with just a field trip. So, unbeknownst to me, uh, we were we Trincaro Estates owns uh, one of their brands is Menage a Trois, and what we did with our beverage management class, we have a beverage management class in our hospitality program, which is embedded in the School of Management. We're a small school, small program, so we have a lot of interdisciplinary work. Uh, within the School of Management. Uh, we took each semester, we would take 25 students on a bus ride uh, to Napa Valley and we would visit a winery, do a tasting, and then come back to campus. So we were we were going to uh, Trinquero's brand Menage a Trois, which is a nice, uh, nice vineyard and very active uh, facility where you could go out and sit on the lawn and kind of um, have a tour, play some games and relax in a social setting, very informal. And do the tasting events, but one of Barry's frontline hospitality professionals uh, reached out to us and just said, hey, which school are you from? We said University of San Francisco. They said, oh, that's great. We love seeing you, uh, but by the way, we have a, a uh, wine education program, and let me put you in touch with Barry, and then next semester, we met with Barry. Barry said, hey, come on over to our culinary center, and they graciously uh, expanded the field trip uh, experience to a wine cellar tour, to a vineyard tour, uh, to the wine education programming, and then a culinary luncheon that was prepared by the chefs there at the uh, culinary center that you saw in the picture. So gradually that relationship built into uh, um, semester visits twice a year. And then from there, we decided that we should start collecting some data and research on the Roma Wheel game. Barry introduced us to the Roma Wheel uh, of Fortune. And then they also, came up with this other game here called the Tung Fu Challenge. And the name there from the vineyard is that they actually take the students that you see in the picture and they they try to teach the students how to identify off aromas, right? So as Barry was mentioning the wine aroma wheel, there's primary aromas, secondary wine aromas, off aromas and tertiary aromas. So the Tung Fu Challenge game was designed to have the students actually locate and identify the off aromas that were in the wines. So as you can see here, I, I identified which Kolb's uh, components uh, fit with the activity. So the concrete experience would be classified as the tour of the vineyard. The uh, reflective observation was the aroma wheel game. So you would reflect on what you learned. Barry had mentioned there was the lecture, but then you would reflect on that lecture and then you would actively uh, experiment with either the guided tasting or the aroma wheel game itself. The aroma wheel game was both reflective observation and active experimentation. And then when we got back to campus, the next lecture that, that we would do um, after the tour and the vineyard experience and the aroma wheel game was abstract conceptualization, which is then the students would take what they've learned and they would do a menu and wine pairing uh, programming and they would each come up with their own menu design with the pairing. Next slide. So just to reiterate to you um, a little bit more now, deeper into experiential learning, there's there's many different delivery mechanisms in, in experiential learning. I just picked out two in, in our literature review for the research project that we worked on was active learning, which could be an example of simulations uh, or media-based uh, activities. And then secondly, game-based learning, you know, the components from the literature and you'll notice uh, on the uh, article that we published together, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sonia Poole, is a marketing professor in the School of Management, and she specializes in gamification and particularly in brand identity. So, so the project, the research project that came from our collaboration with Barry was um, also interdisciplinary because a marketing professor and I got together myself with a hospitality background and and uh, Dr. Poole with her gamification background, she was interested in the branding aspect. And you'll see in a moment, we, we wove into the research questions of intention to do business with the brand to satisfy her desire in her research area. But having said that, the game-based learning components that are important in, in terms of, um, of the pedagogy have, have to reflect elements of an immersion. So you can obviously see that the trip to the vineyard was immersive. There needs to be points. So as the way Barry created his aroma wheel game, each team splits off and you answer, you spin the wheel, you try to identify the aroma in the vial. 
And if you can get the aroma correct, you get five points. If you don't, the other team can guess and steal the five points. So that, that was consistent with game-based learning and points. And obviously that's the competitive part. You can, it's really interesting to see the students competing with one another. As Barry mentioned, they started doing betting. Our, none of our students did that from what I can see very young. Maybe they were doing that behind the scenes. But the competition seems to generate, when you observe the, um, the game-based learning activity itself, the competition seems to in heighten engagement levels and excitement levels and participation levels. That's something that I observed over the course of doing these uh, experiments. And then the social interaction is wonderful. You get to see that uh, throughout the day when you're immersed at the vineyard in the Wine Education Center. But most importantly, you also see the socialization taking place within the game itself between and among the team members. Um, Game-based learning is also augmenting learning activities. So you'll notice um, on the previous slide when I mentioned that when we go back to the campus, back into the classroom, we did the menu and wine pairing uh, learning activity. And then lastly, Game-based learning constructs uh, involve some level of exploration and making mistakes. So obviously, uh, spinning the aroma wheel and then smelling the different aromas uh, allows you to either get that right or make mistakes and learn. And, and by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Barry's team also, when you play the aroma wheel, has um, cards that are developed with both visual and um, written text explaining each of the aromas. So it's not like you're starting to guess the uh, primary and secondary aromas right out right out from scratch. You ac actually have cheat sheet cue cards that you can use, and it still is very difficult to identify the aromas. Next slide, please. OK, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, Barry and I really hit it off well, and his team uh, 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 was very receptive to our, our frequent visits to the property. So. We spread out the uh, the research project I proposed. Why don't we write up a paper on this? And Barry was uh, happy to do so. And you can see that uh, my colleague, Dr. Sonia Poole, uh, from the marketing department in the School of Management, myself, Barry, and Barry's colleague, Susan Smith, who have since retired. Susan's a wonderful example of hospitality in action, probably the uh, warmest and most welcoming uh, hospitality practitioner you'll ever meet in your life and very knowledgeable. So. The four of us got together and we 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 wanted to do this uh, over time. So basically, we took classroom size of 25 students per semester and we spread it out over about six semesters. So we alternated each semester. Um, we would do the game versus the no game experiment. And basically what that means is, is that one set of students played the game and the other set of students did not play the game, but all of the other activities remained the same. So the other experiential learning activities wrapped around the wine aroma wheel game were in place, which was Barry's lecture, uh, the luncheon and the food and wine pairing, a wine tasting, a tour of the cellar, and a view of the vineyard. The only difference for the game students was we inserted the aroma wheel game into that, into that uh, field trip. So what we sought out to do was really learn uh, how the students uh, felt about participating in a, in a wine aroma game, uh, how the students uh, perceived learning about wine aromas in a social context, uh, and then also did the wine aroma game activities stimulate more intention for them to want to engage with the brand. Uh, so those were the three underlying research questions. We got a sample of 154, and again, that was spread out over six semesters. Um, so this, this took, a, took three years. Um, and then we use survey instrumentation. We had 19 questions on the survey. Likert style uh, uh, ordinal scale was used to measure. And what we were looking for was the attitudes in the learning and brand management. And again, comparing game participants versus non-game participants. And then we used a uh, bipolar normalization scale to, uh, to uh, measure the Likert scale um, responses. So we used a normalization scale of minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. Next slide. So very simple t-test what we ran just to compare the mean scores uh, out of the, uh, the total survey responses in aggregate. So you can see here that social context game versus no game showed 
um, a higher mean score, a 149 versus a 132. Intent to do business was a 1.20 versus a 1.17. Next slide, please. And with respect to the research questions we sought out, you could see that 44% of the game participants, remember we had, we had um, most likely strongly agree, et cetera, on the bipolar uh, Likert scale versus 25 point, about 26% of the non-game participants felt strongly about the uh, desire to learn about wines uh, in general. The second research question regarding the game versus no game in terms of participating in the social context, again, was similar. 48% of all the respondents that played the game felt that um, a stronger desire to learn about wine in a social context versus those that didn't play the game. And then lastly, regarding engagement with the brand, uh, intention to do business. And remember, I thought this was interesting, is that both groups, the non-game and the game participants, were immersed in the, in, in the winery experience. So they had the same experience, but for playing the game, and you can see the difference between the game respondents versus non-game in terms of their desire to do business with Trincaro family estates in the future. Okay, I think uh, that's the last slide. I think we can open it up for questions if you'd like for either Barry or I. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, folks, um, if you do have a question, uh, go ahead and, and ask the question in the live event Q&A, and we'll be kind of monitoring those questions, and I'll kind of relay those questions um, to everyone. But uh, once again, folks, if you do have a question, go ahead and add it to the Q&A uh, section, and we'll go ahead and kind of kind of ask our, our speakers about those questions. Um, while folks do have a chance to answer those questions, um, let me start off with, with one. I was kind of curious, if you can kind of talk a little bit about, you know, um, you know, doing a collaboration, um, I, I think many of us would absolutely love to partner with an industry, you know, uh, practitioner in terms of our, our research, but we're not exactly sure how we should do that. Um, I was just kind of curious if any of you, either of you have any uh, suggestions or tactics on, on how we can do that. Do you want to go first, Bear? You know, Eric, but I'm sorry, my dog was barking. They're blowing. They're, they're doing the lawn out here right now. Uh, well, you run your question past me again, please. Oh, sure, absolutely. Thanks. I was just kind of curious. I was curious uh, if you could comment on, you know, how one could actually partner with industry, you know, for a, a research uh, a project. I think many of us really want to, you know, partner with, um, you know, practitioners and and industry for some of our, our research projects, but we just don't know how to do that. So I was curious if you have any best tips or suggestions on how um, academics or professors could actually do that? You know, um, I think what the relationship that Tom and I have, um, and then we have connections with people all over the industry. Um, you know, a, a company such as Trincaro, we're, we're large. I mean, we have, we have relationships all over the world. Um, so I'd say a supplier, like you're working with us right now, uh, could be the conduit um, to, you know, just about any kind of industry, whether it's on-premise, off-premise, uh, wholesaler. Uh, we have relationships with all of them, very strong relationships. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, in working many years with, with all of these segments of the industry, um, I think they jump on the opportunity to do something like this. Because, I, I, you know, the, what Tom has found in what we do is it makes us feel really great. I mean, this is great research. And it's also letting us know, we feel like it's effective, but to actually see it um, and, and prove that it's effective and what we're doing, it, it's it's a wonderful thing. So, I mean, we could be a conduit um, more than happy, any kind of supplier um, to any degree. So I'm happy to help, happy to help. Yeah, and Eric, I would just add, um, I think a couple of things. One is gonna be proximity and access, right? So. It has to be easy. I, I think it has to be easy for the industry uh, partner to want to participate. So it's respecting their time that they're they're very busy. You know, they have a full time job and they're very busy. So what I try to do is I try to understand from an empathetic standpoint what kind of value that I can offer to the practitioner 
uh, industry practitioner without disturbing their workload. So I, I kind of pitched that I'll do the heavy lifting, which is what I did with Barry. You know, I said, and then I, I also thought if Barry, Barry would value um, being on a publication. All the work that he's done and the, his creative thinking and having someone steer him through that and work with him. And, and he provided the access, he provided the, the training, he provided the venue. And then I had to construct the project, the research itself. So the key there is also making sure that you keep it simple enough, but meaningful enough, because as you know, as fellow professors, it has to be have some rigor to it to get published. So there's a there's a tug of war between what can I do that's that's applicable to Barry and make sense that he's willing to give a little bit of his time versus what I can feel uh, can get published. So that, that's the balance. And then really promising to do the heavy lifting is the key. Great, wonderful. And once again, folks, um, if you did have a question, um, feel free to go ahead and add those in the, the Q&A section. Um, and, and maybe I, I have one kind of one other question. I was curious, what's the next step in this in this stream of research? If there is going to be or or any suggestions for kind of some future ideas or for some uh, a future streams of research in, in this area? Barry, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or or, or maybe here's another way to ask you as an industry practitioner. What are some other avenues of research that we should be looking at in kind of the beverage world? Uh, um, I was curious if you have any any ideas or suggestions for some future ideas, you know, kind of the research in this area that we should be looking at. Um, wow. You know, I, I think that food and beverage professionals, I can speak from my own experience, I think what a lot of us can, is people don't realize that you know, we love this industry, we love what we do, but at it, the it, it, end of the day, it's still a business. We need to make money. So I think some kind of emphasis or some kind of study on the profitability of a successful wine program or an express or, 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 or like a, a, a cocktail program uh, within an industry, what kind of, pro especially right now, um, you know, these uh, restaurants need to make profit. Um, so the profitability of a, of a successful beverage program and an adult beverage program, um, I think more attention needs to be given to that in the schools um, because I can tell you when when I was in well this was many many years ago good lord decades ago but um, there was really very little of that very little to show true profitability um, and what to do to make that profit um, and, it, and beverage of course we know we make a lot of money on beverage um, and I think it needs to be driven more that needs to be uh, emphasized more. Yeah, I would add, Eric, um, one of the other things that we've done with uh, Barry, too, in that scaffolding, the relationship is, uh, I mentioned earlier that, I, that I'm in the School of Management, so I also teach in the MBA program, and I teach uh, business modeling and design thinking, and we ended up pitching experiential learning projects to Trincaro uh, regarding any projects that our MBA students needed to do in the business modeling class and, and Barry introduced us to their spirits division. So we did two other projects with them. The spirits division wanted to know um, consumer behavior feedback on their packaging and on the branding. And then we also did a project with Sutter Home uh, on Tetra packaging, meaning Sutter Home was trying to look at how to package different varietal packs of wines specifically for millennials and and Gen Xers that were wanting to go to the beach. And they're so like, let's say there's a social gathering and I have to bring the, the beverages for everybody. Well, do I pick a white wine, a red wine or a rosé? Well, what, what Sutter Home wanted to know was what happens if we do a mixed six pack and we put it in a Tetra pack and we put one of everything, a Sauvignon Blanc, a Chardonnay, a, uh, a, a rosé and all that. So. Um, I would suggest other areas would be generational perceptions from a consumer perspective on on the consumption of wine, right? Yes. Next, you know, Gen Z is coming that way, right? They're going to be of age uh, fairly quickly here, so they'll be the next generational cohort. So I, I would think generational and also consumer marketing would be interesting areas for further research. Yeah, good point. Wonderful, I uh, appreciate the answer. And then lastly, my final question, this is probably the most important question, as you know, most of the, the country kind of heads to the fall autumn season, um, at least in, in Colorado, temperatures are a little cooler now and, and a little less light in the evening. What wine should I be drinking? <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, it, it, we always say any wine that you enjoy any time of the year, but, um, but it's seasonal for me too. I drink a lot of, a lot of white wine, rosés, of course, during the, uh, during the summer months, but, um, but, you know, I love my, you know, Pinot Noirs and Cabernets and Merlots and, you know, during the winter months. Um, but, you know, my wife is a professional chef. She's classically trained Italian chef. And um, so, you know, I, I, I pair my wine with food always, always. Yeah. So <laughs> anything never, you want to drink. <laughs> I'll never turn down a glass of Bordeaux, Eric. Yeah, Water that's true. Yeah. Very, very good. Spanish wine too. Spanish wines don't get enough attention yep. and, and they're growing in popularity and for good reason. Enjoy some great wines from Spain, from Rioja, from Rio Spigius. Um, beautiful, beautiful wines. Wonderful. Very good. Well, well, uh, uh, Barry and, and Dr. Meyer, I want to thank you very much. Um, this was absolutely fantastic. We do we, have one question. It, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, could you talk about students learning curve on the game? Go ahead, Barry, you go first. You know, it, it, yeah, you know, it's it's, you know, and it's, it's a great question because um, we take our, our sense of smell for granted and we have this wonderful gift, all the gifts we have, our sight, smell, taste, everything. And people don't realize how, and, and Tana even actually uh, mentioned it, how challenging it is. Because when you think about all the runs, we have the gift of sight, so we call it uh, sight bias. If you see an apple, it's like, I don't even have to think about what an apple smells like. It smells like an apple. But somebody who doesn't have the gift of sight has to really challenge themselves to say, okay, what is this, an apple, a pear, a peach? Um, so the learning curve, I'd say, you know, and I've seen groups come out multiple times to play the Aroma Wheel of Fortune. And after a while, probably about maybe a third time, fourth time, they get, they get a, a comfort zone with the fundamental aromas in wine, like the foundation aromas in wine. And when they get that that foundation built of those those wine recognitions, then they feel more confident and they can build on that foundation of really recognizing those core aromas in wine. But it takes, as far as the learning curve, it takes several times. It takes maybe three or four times, half a dozen times, depending on uh, depending on the person. Now, for chefs, because chefs work in the kitchen, they they have to they have to be really acute with a sense of smell and something smells something smells good or smells off or um, chefs immediately i mean they take to the game and they love the game because they're very good at it so they can really detect aromas because they're around produce they're around different aromas um so yeah it's a great question um, but there is there's quite a learning curve it really is yeah that's a great question i'll, I'll just add um you know that question's fascinating in, in many different areas but i'll say that what's interesting is some and believe it or not in the composition of the student in our classes because we're a small program, we open up the class. Um, we'll take 15 hospitality majors and we'll open it up to 10 uh, other students from the whole campus as a whole. So we'll have non-hospitality students in there with hospitality students. And it's interesting, if you get biology students, we get chemistry students, we get nursing students. And I was trying to determine, and if I were to do future research, I probably would have bifurcated on understand in the data collection how the responses were if we we asked them their major but um keep in mind that some students and we have international students too so we have and we have a very university of san francisco is a i think we're rated one of the top diverse uh student populations in the united states so we have a very diverse student pop population and some of the students international students it's the first time they've ever drank wine so, so our class runs six weeks. It's a two credit class. We get into wines, uh, you know, we break the class up into beverage. Beverages, we do spirits, beer and wine, and then non-alcoholic beverages. So their first introduction to wine may be in the lectures in class before they go on the field trip. So some of them have never drank wine very much. And then secondly, to the point of what is the learning curve that, that really brings to the forefront what we're, we're seeing now is how do we become more more inclusive in the classroom and i've been looking at an extension of experiential learning in terms of this universal um design learning right udl so we're trying if you if you think about how the different learners are going to want to be included in that experience how do you design the syllabus and these activities around that so i think this issue of uh, inclusion can can have an impact on the learning curve, despite the fact that learning about aromas is very difficult. How do we take in 
you know, universal design learning into the into account when we do a topic that that uh, is is highly technical to begin with. You know, Tom, you brought up something that's really interesting, and we've been doing the Aroma Wheel presentation for about 25 years now. And, um, you know, what we found out is that people who don't know anything about wine and the beauty about this Aroma Wheel game is that you don't need to drink wine to, to, to enjoy this seminar and understand this seminar. And the people who do best have no have no complication when it comes to their it's like, oh, yeah, it's an apple. It smells like an apple. Those are some of the some underage, underage, the people who can't even drink. Um, they're more uh, apt to get it correct before uh, for somebody who drinks a lot of wine. You know, it's crazy, but it's true. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, Dr. Meyer, another question popped up about teaching. So I'm going to direct this question to you. Um, how would the, you know, the kind of the, the, the game element be applied into the online environment? I know um, several of us have had to switch, you know, courses, uh, wine courses, beverage courses had had to have had to pivot in the last year and a half to the online virtual environment. Any thoughts how 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 that could be applied? Yeah, I thought about that myself because I had to teach the, these two beverage classes online and it was very difficult. Um, without the interaction, right, and without the ability to taste. But but two things I did look into, and I should have called Barry to see if Barry, Barry's a great educator. He, he probably would have come up with a mini wine aroma wheel, uh, a fortune game. But I actually looked to see if I could deliver that online. And, it, and um, there's some games that you can play with um, bingo. There's some wine bingo games that you could play. But I stayed away from them because I didn't want to reach out and, and, and navigating the Zoom environment. I wanted to be careful not to be fumbling around and, and understanding what I could be doing technically with, with, uh, with what I wanted to do with the learning. But one thing I did discover is uh, there's a company called Vinebox, V-I-N-E-B-O-X. And what I did was you could buy a package of, oh, hang on, let me show it to you. <laughs> Okay, so you can order the box, and then inside the box are these little test tube size samples of wine. So uh, this was a gift to me, that's why I had the idea, but this one had nine. I just picked out three, and then I pre-ordered those and then had them ship. The company ships them directly to the student's home. So what I did then was we did coordinated tastings with the same wines, and we had some consistency. Otherwise, I was saying for this week's lecture, we're going to do a Chardonnay from the New World. And I gave them maybe three locations, but everybody was getting so many different wines that I couldn't control the consistency of the tasting. And I had a guided tasting sheet, and we went through a, went through that um, with some multimedia and some video. And then what I did is I had some um, wine fact cards, and I just played a guess the name of the uh, the wine with the card. I tried to get a little bit of uh, interactive activity going. That's great. And if I oh. can just add add to that really quickly, uh, Eric, um, you know, we've had to adapt uh, because all of our seminars, everything are done at the winery, as we've explained. And um, but we have have a whole virtual program now, a, a whole all of these uh, virtual classes that we do. And like I mentioned before, the hallmark is interactive learning. So over the past year and a half we've we've adapted very quickly and uh we've done many many virtual trainings and education for professionals in the industry uh country clubs around the uh around the country you know they want to get together but they don't want to feel like comfortable leaving the country club uh we did we did one recently actually we did an aroma wheel of fortune and we have a virtual spinning aroma wheel um uh, virtual um and so they were in ocean springs mississippi in the yacht club in ocean springs mississippi they had wine in front of them and everything and um i have a very dear friend who's who's a resident there and uh, we shipped an aroma box so he and his wife were, were taking the aroma vials you know out into the audience and we were on the virtual so we've been doing a lot of virtual wine education um quite a bit and we're still doing it um we still have a lot of momentum because uh, people do enjoy it, whether it's live and in person, but they came out to, can't come out to Napa Valley, we're going to come to them. So, Yeah, wonderful. Uh, a great example is of not only education, higher ed, but also uh, industry pivoting um, as relates to kind of training and, and um, um, exp experiential um, um, experiences. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing those thoughts and appreciate the, 
the um, the white box. How how fantastic! And then it looks like there's a, another comment that was just kind of left um, as far as kind of a suggestion for future research. And I think this is great. Uh, the idea of you know coffee cupping and and also other beverages as well that could be an interesting avenue to to explore in terms of research. Any thoughts on that comment? Go ahead, Barry. You can go first. Yeah, I, I absolutely. Um, you know, of course, wine is 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 a very very complex beverage. As simple as it is, it's just, it's, it's just fermented grape juice, but it can be a very very complex because you know a wine is not only a reflection of the grape variety, but also the place where it came from. So wine is a natural for developing uh, these kind of education programs. Um, now we can do stuff in the world of spirits, of course, um, but it's not going to be as complex. Um, is the world of wine. It still be, could be very complex, but not, not as complex as the world of wine, uh, because of course, whiskeys, there's whiskeys, there's bourbon, there's scotches, there's gins. Um, so we do, uh, but we haven't done it yet, but you could develop um, using the same kind of inspiration from the world of wine. You could put it in the world of spirits, absolutely. And we know the world of spirits is, is growing in popularity. In fact, we, uh, we have a, a spirits certification program, just like we have a wine certification program as well. So can it be adapted? Absolutely. To, to any degree that has been, not yet. There's, there's potential for the future. That's for sure. Yeah, I would just say I think coffee would be a great idea. Um, my dilemma with, with, the, uh, with the classroom setting is in a two credit, six week course, I really run out of time fast, right? Because I also have them, we take, we, we skip a class to go on the field trip because the field trip ends up being an entire Saturday because it's a two hour drive each way. So that's four hours and then we're about two hours at the vineyard. So um, I struggle with having enough time in a two credit class to, to really dive deeper into coffee. Um, I will share with you that when we get to the spirits section, the students are less interested in trying to um, identify aromas with the spirits. And I use the eyedropper to try to put the water drop in there to get, but. The students respond most to experimenting with, with spirits and infusions. So we'll take a we'll take a bourbon and and actually put uh, some juniper berries in it and let it sit for for a week or two weeks and see if they can make an old fashioned and what does it do to the taste of the old fashioned by experimenting. So in terms of the classroom, that's what happens. In terms of my own research, I would think that the uh, we're seeing a lot of experimentation with industry now with a lot of seltzers and in and, and, um, and beer beers and uh, spritzers and you're seeing a lot of inventiveness I think with with uh, beverage product and then I always wanted to get to if you were to ask me where I would go I would go to the health I tried to go into the health aspects of alcohol which I'm always shunned because how can consuming alcohol be healthy but I think there could be some health benefits and or getting into plant-based diet and looking at that from a research standpoint. Wonderful. Plant-based plant spirits, right? You can get into you can get into that. That's great. Wonderful. Fantastic suggestions. Really pre appreciate uh, both of your your uh, insight. All right, well, very well. Uh, Dr. Meyer and Barry, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your schedule to come and, and talk a little bit about some new ideas in, in higher education. Uh, really appreciate your insight and your valuable ideas for our own research agendas and, and um, ideas for the classroom. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Welcome, Eric. Thanks for putting this together. What a great idea. And yeah. we appreciate the invitation. Good work on your part. And uh, if anyone wants to reach out, we're happy to consider any collaborations in the future too. Absolutely wonderful. And that's exactly why we're doing this, just for a chance for all us to kind of for all of us to come together and start having these conversations. Thank you, everyone, and I hope everyone has a good day. Bye now.